It is February the 26th? 6th? 6th? I think that's how you pronounce it, right? 2022! And this is the future of photography. (laughs) (laughs) What is the future of photography? (laughs) Oh man, what a crazy week. What a crazy yeah. week. Um, yeah. Well, 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 but... Hopefully we'll offer a little escapism here into the creative world um, to just get away from global events for maybe a few minutes. I think that's that's our that's our task for, uh, for today. This is episode 215 of The Future of Photography. It is Jeremiah Chechik and myself, Chris. Adrian is somewhere. I don't even know where he is. I, I think <laughs> I, I, I think he's busy with something um, very likely. So uh, it's the two of us, and we are going to bring you just a a handful, one and a half hand of hands picks. full of picks. Yeah, we more have picks, uh, more put, picks. We've put uh, things together that that have tickled each of us in one way or the other. Um, of course, surrounding photography, and I will kick off with mine, which is one of those, yeah, a bit of a sad thing, because if you look at what what's happening in the photo industry, and uh, at least me being one of the um, one of the one of the photographers who grew up with mirrors in their cameras, um, those are on the way out. The DSLRs are on the way out, and this shows in Canon, who have have just discontinued like a whole bunch of their EF lenses, and uh, I think there's like nine officially left now. Out of uh, do you remember how many lenses Canon had in the EF department? Oh God, I think yes, a fifty or more. Like, oh yeah, I think it was more. I remember getting those little catalogs even before the web where, where they had little graphics of every lens yeah, page, after page after page after page. Impressive lineup. And, and it was fun. You wanted all of them. Um, my, my question to you, Chris, is this truly sad or is it just another evolution? Uh, of course, it's an evolution. But, you know, you know, you get used to a few things and the mirror and the camera and the optical light path that is instantaneous. Um and also the 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 let's say the requirement of having certain skills that you might not necessarily need as much in today's photography with uh, cameras doing more and more for you at least from a technical side um as a bit of a a bit of a sigh here a bit of a ah, yeah. yeah well there's some nostalgia attached absolutely, to these absolutely. these these weighty <laughs> weighty lenses um but but there's also um uh, another dimension to it which is that that canon maybe is pointing forward and is going to okay one day i get this right <laughs> we do this all the time anyway uh, but but that, that canon is actually pointing at the future rather than the past yeah. and of course the way i look at it um uh, ebay hands are clapping <laughs> <laughs> because those uh, photographers who are addicted, need it, broke their lens, really no. use it, and maybe maybe that's where they're going to find it. And I think that will that market that that use market will be quite saturated for quite a while. So I, yeah, you're right. It, it, it will be saturated, but eventually it'll be like uh, today's uh, buying a used car. I don't know if it's the same in Germany, but evidently supply chain issues, chips shortages, uh, transport right. issues, um, fuel costs have, have made um, buying new cars a very lengthy in terms of delivery process here. And so the the prices of used cars have really sailed upwards at least that's what i read i, I have no first hand knowledge yeah, of it that, but that's just um, that's just what, like like a plant that you forget to water and it'll just it, it'll just like live up one last time to <laughs> give everything and then yeah. um so yeah so yeah the the dslrs are out on the way out yeah, but I, but you I, know I, you know I, I've, I've i was out today with monica we've been shooting film today <laughs> for the afternoon film wow what a concept so yeah. i shot i shot a, a zeiss econta a zeiss econ mm. camera 
with medium format film and everything fully manual and it was a blast and that thing is i don't know 60 years old probably yes and and the thing is you can still do that yeah and len lenses you know, don't I, age as as quick as fast as other things so yeah no i've had a lot of fun speaking of lenses um using you know a a, uh, a lumix with some adapters mm -hmm. and those kind of old russian lenses um, that are oh, easily 50 years old um, and and the glass is <laughs> somewhat suspect. But, the, but what you get, especially blending those old lenses, old glass, no coatings with digital capture is unique and interesting. And, and uh, you maybe couple that with some interesting washi film or different kind of new limited edition uh, film stocks that people uh, and companies are repackaging, you can find a, a kind of uh, a little crack in a kind, I guess, in a style that is uh, determined by the combination of your equipment that allows you to discover new ways of seeing, new ways of appreciating. And so sometimes these, these old lenses coupled with new, uh, approaches or even trying to go back to the old ones. I mean, I'm always fascinated by uh, collodion and, and, and plate photography. The people lug around these massive metal plates and these buses. And but like, I've, I, I am too lazy to do that, but my <laughs> appreciation for the images are absolutely astounding. I, I, I find the images themselves captivating, not just because they are a kind of nostalgic uh, view of of the world, whether it's portraiture or landscape, but but because there is a quality to the image that feels as modern as the day they first emerged on the photography call it market, um, and they were like a pain in the ass to use. I think you know maybe a year ago we did a a, a show on slow photography, and I, I think I presented a Japanese photographer who would I mean he would spend like months setting up and, and uh, focused on taking a simple, hey, hey, single hey, image. Hey, hey, hey. Sorry for that. That was that was no. that that was too early. I was supposed to show that early later. Um let's move to the second one. You brought sure. a photo project by Ned Walthall. Yeah, these are these are kind of this is um I brought this because I wanted people to um to appreciate randomness, uh, you know, uh, par part of it is I thought that, uh, and that that could be a subject for uh, a whole podcast of all of us. But randomness is very, very uh, interesting to me. Uh, setting up a camera, uh, setting it up in Grand Central, I I've shot there, and, and the light is magnificent. I've, comes I've from shot there time. several it's times. Exciting. Yeah, Grand yeah, Central Station is beautiful. It has chiaroscuro kind of naturally built into the architecture. And if you just focus on a certain plane yeah. uh, of light and capture, and there's so many people walking through, the randomness of it um, can be distilled in, in absolute beauty. Um, and, and I think this particular project, this particular photographer, captures a kind of a moment in time, uh, obviously around the pandemic, uh, With of, people wearing um, masks, yeah. Yes, it, it, but but there is a certain majesty to it that is kind of classic in some ways because of the light um, and consistent in terms of his composition, um, but refreshing in terms of color and and uh, the moment. Yeah. And so um, I, I just find that sometimes going out without any sense of what you are intending to capture. And just setting something up and seeing what happens is as exciting as actually fulfilling an intention. And uh, that's the kind of street type photography project that uh, works really well in New York City. It would less so in the country. <laughs> it would completely not work here in Germany. It would you would you would not be able to publish <laughs> any of that because you'd probably have a lawsuit against you pretty soon. Probably, yeah. yeah. You could do cows crossing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, but but sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, and and uh, that's another discussion: is do you own your own image? That's a very yeah, very a very totally different discussion. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and probably we don't at so, the end of the day. What you heard earlier was um, a, a video. Well, it's a, it's actually audio, which I came across uh, the other day, and it's about a photographer. Have you heard of uh, William Henry Jackson? No, most likely not. He is a photographer who was born in 1843, like right at the dawn of photography. And mm -hmm. uh, he was interviewed. Um, he was he was interviewed in 1941, and that was that was on his on the eve on his of his 98th birthday, and he was a photographer. An American photographer, a Civil War veteran, a painter, an explorer, a traveler, and uh, he he did like a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. And this is a this is an interview of a guy who was actually in the Wild West, and it's in audio, and uh, they show a few pictures here, and um, I'm just bring that up. It's it's kind of hard to understand if you if you're not a native speaker, but and the game would scatter into the mountains. And hide away. And it's, it's like half an hour long, and it's it's just a delight to listen to. I listened to the whole thing. I had to rewind a few times because it was oh, hard to understand. That, but that, that looks absolutely fantastic. Really, was, really great. He was one of the first photographers uh, in existence. And he was one of the first commercial photographers, and he did a big survey for the U.S. government and these kind of things. And he traveled through the entire world, and he brought pictures from from Siberia, and he brought pictures from India, from Africa, mm -hmm. from like in the in the mid to late 1800s. Isn't that? Oh, this is ma uh, magic. Uh, Is there magic. a book it, on his work? I have no idea, but again, his name is William Henry Jackson, and uh, he was. Uh, this is an, a restored audio thing that was recorded by some government agency. So it wasn't even for radio; it was kind of a, a preservation of a, hist of a historic document. So yeah. it was, um, yeah, a really interesting little piece of history that goes back as far back as you can go with photography. You know, what's interesting is you have photographers like that, and there m must have been at that point probably hundreds, you know, unlikely thousands, but probably hundreds. Probably, yes. Who are of the same. And their archives, and one, one wonders what happened to them. Did they last? Did they get destroyed? Uh, and th those are things that, that I think all photographers now come to kind of realize is what do you do? How do you manage your archive? <laughs> Especially nowadays. Thinking about the future of your life. Especially uh, nowadays. And, and I've, <laughs> I've talked to an archivist uh, who's, who told me that we are living in the, in, in the future. This, this time, our time will be looked back, at the, back as, uh, as one of the worst documented in history. Yes, because it'll all be gone. Some EMP will will make all our images go. Um, it's funny. In my archive. I, I have been um, in kind of a email discussion with the Library of Congress to mm -hmm. leave my my stuff to them. Oh wow! Which are really really excellent, and you know, and and because um, I've been thinking about it. I mean, how how do I manage you know a hundred thousand photos? Yeah. Uh, after I'm gone, like, you know, my, my kids will put, delete, boom, right, gone. Like, what are they going to do with it? Right. Um, leaving it to gallerists who are kind of aged is not really going to, you know, going to accomplish much. But I think as a, just a historical record and not really as something that has any, quote, intrinsic value other than they were images captured at a certain time and place, um, they would have some, given what you've just said, which is, you know, I, I do believe you're right that that uh, in the future, with all of the mass adoption of photography, but the very little attention paid to archiving, same, and and how, you know, acts 
uh, such as EMPs, uh, you know, deterioration oh, of hard drives, etc. Just, et just a simple fact of formats changing. I, I remember I used to work <laughs> in the computer industry, and uh, I remember we had an old system that there was still a, a support contract for, and the client had a problem, and. I was the one to f to figure out how to load tapes like like the ones you see in science fiction movies with with sure. data on that look yeah. like uh, mm -hmm. like reel to reel yeah. stuff uh, and I had to we, we had to reactivate uh, an old guy Univax. in his in his Univax. 80s who used to sure. used to uh, handle that stuff and who kind of knew a few tricks uh, how to get this stuff to work and it was um yeah and that was if only that was only 20 me, years old, you know. This. If somebody could tell me how to activate, I, I found a really interesting floppy disk with uh, a whole pile of notes on a movie that was never made, that I'm absolutely dying to reread and 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 and, and see. It was very early in my film uh, career, at, but it's on a you know five and a half inch floppy. It's in very very good shape. Let's <laughs> try and find a reader that would. Manage uh, when I was I mean, thinking don't, you about. You don't even have to go back to floppies. How about a zip disk? How about a zip disk? <laughs> That's right. Interesting. Um, and this this may be of of kind of in, in interesting adjunct to archiving is um, several years ago I had a conversation um, with uh, the major uh, archiving company, I think, uh, call it uh, Black Mountain or it's something mountain, mm -hmm. not, not important. Uh, they, they did all, they do all the archiving for governments and, oh, I see. Um, and hospitals and medical records. And they, 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 their stuff is, is basically, they, they continually update the data into the newest formats. Um, and it's all kept uh, in different locations Stone Mountain, maybe, but literally in Colorado mountains, bomb proof, all the rest of it. And so I said, you know, uh, and these are like thousand terabyte, you know, operations for, right. for governments and, and companies. And I said, you know, I have about at the time, maybe a terabyte of stuff. Uh, I just like to get it up there. How for, much? <laughs> and they, this is like maybe 10 years ago. And they went, oh, you know, a terabyte, mm, that would be about $25,000. No, that's not too bad. A month. What? <laughs> yeah, my okay. reaction is what. And so that's pretty secure. <laughs> but if you miss a payment, <laughs> you're gone. So, um, you know, ar archiving is probably another subject that we should we should uh, you know get into at a later date. But <laughs> but uh, when you look at the the your your pick, it really makes you appreciate how important it is to save, find, hunt down, and collect images that will eventually have lasting uh, value because you and I have we've talked about this before, but any photograph that's like 50 years old that you hold in your hand, like as an object, has incredible power and interest, no matter what, of a baby, of a family, of a horse, of a of a car. It all is amazing. And and so the historical record that we find you know, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of photographs being captured today, how many will survive? We both don't think many. Well, we are in a, a quite inflationary times in terms of photography. I don't know how many millions of pictures are up uploaded every single, maybe not even day, maybe every single hour. I don't, yeah. yeah. Anyway, you brought the next one, which is uh, don't take, what is don't take pictures.com? It's a mag magazine, <laughs> encouraging people not to take pictures. <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's a very interesting um, online and in print um, magazine, call it. Um, and and I, I, I like it because it, it doesn't seem to have a, and this is, I think, a value, a consistent um, editorial focus except doing things that are interesting this i think i i brought this particular noel mason um for a pick when i first started 
uh, with you guys uh, podcasting. I, I just thought that was amazing. And he had built these enormous x-ray machines. Um, but they, they're, you know, they, they just focus on different kinds of things uh, from pure street photography to what you're looking at now, cyanotypes. Um, and it, it's just a very good uh, inspirational um, thing to read that that is not kind of hugely ad driven or uh, doesn't have an agenda. It's just an appreciation from left field. Its editorial content is very wide and diverse, which I love. Looks beautiful. Looks beautiful. Just just the visual, the the choice of photography or of art is yeah is uh, yeah. It's no popular like it. photography. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. No, it's, awesome. it's real magic, and anyone who is half interested in photography should take a look. Back okay, to you. Uh, I brought a pic. Uh, I brought a project. Um, I'm not sure if we talked about it here. Uh, I, th I have talked about it on several other um, outlets, but it's one of these projects where you know you know how they. Um, Uh, some some projects recreate old photos, like you to try oh, to find the same location, and then you take the same picture and you put them side yeah, by people side, hold or up postcards, or you hold that, one up, and or or you or you find the same people and you add at the same person, but they are now yeah. 50 years older, and but you yeah. put them in the same pose. These kind of projects, and uh, uh, there is one by a photographer called Christian Oslund from uh, Norway, Norway, I think, and. Uh, It is about the glaciers of Svalbard. Now, hmm. up in Svalbard, um, in the Arctic, um, th there are glaciers. There's lots of ice and lots of snow. But uh, the, t the times change and the climate changes. And uh, what he did is he recreated photos of glaciers at the same location with the hmm. same um, kind of setup. And, of course, it is a stark difference because there's, uh, like, <laughs> so much retreat in these glaciers but he 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 topped it by um also putting the same props in the same locations like a, a boat, <laughs> a boat. Yeah, yeah. the one is on right. the one hand is wooden this is like a hundred years difference i think the yeah. one is, well, is side is wooden exact same location you can hardly see the mountains on the left and on the right hand side free view and a rubber zodiac um Or a person standing, yeah. looking out this is, on a this bay. This is great. Stuff. This is amazing. Great stuff. Uh, really amazing and and profound and scary, shocking and it, sad. It it uses art to drive home a completely different message. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, it is scary. It is shocking. And uh, yeah, our yeah, these are our these world are, is changing. Yes, and changing rapidly. Uh, they've just discovered that these particle soot in Antarctica, because of all the visitors' research, etc., just generating power for them to survive, is kind of micro covered the snow, which is attracting more heat yes. and accelerating melt. Yes. Um, so <laughs> we find out new things every day. <laughs> There's uh, we, so so the the what people might not know is that I make another podcast about the polar regions called Curiously Polar, and uh, uh, with two friends of mine who are both met on travels to the Arctic, and they both been guides up there. One is a marine biologist, the other is is more on the glacier and volcano side, and. Um, it's it's like a, a really amazing um, journey to learn about more about these regions, about the people, about the economics, the social political areas of the, uh, and and aspects of things. And the one thing, and of course climate. And uh, one thing that we recently talked about were those microplastics up there. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that. You, yes, you do find all sorts of polyethylene and polypropylene and um, rubber from tires. Um, you find all that in the Arctic. Um, but you find all that minus the rubber from tires in the Antarctic. Oh, that's so interesting. So, that, okay, I, was, I, was, I, I, I do not have an explanation. I think it might be because... There are just so many, so many more cars in the northern hemisphere than there are in the southern hemisphere. 
And yeah, it's it, it's possible. I you know I've I, I've kind of hiked on the glaciers down in you know uh, the lowest part of of you know Punta Arenas and and you know down there uh, in South America, and and the you know as a photographer you're there you're taking these pictures and you realize this will all be gone. This is disappearing. Um, you know, in the big picture of 100 million years of, of human history, um, these things have kind of disappeared and come back and disappeared and come back. And it's only the impact on kind of current humanity, say 300,000 years, that we have some nostalgic for the way things should be or aren't. Well, and but, and it looks like the 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 impact that we have we have had over the last let's say three hundred years um, has been more than anything else that had an impact. Last million years, yeah. <laughs> so whatever, <sighs> hundred thousand years, but but you know, and and it will turn against us and eventually probably wipe us out because you know we we can't we will be sowing the seeds of our own destruction as I think we know both socially politically and of course uh, scientifically with climate etc and and um, that's why th the impact of a photograph often uh, is much stronger than any film any science paper any discussion any argument those pictures that you just showed are a kind of vivid demonstration of our impact on the world we live in and you only need to see one to go wow so mm -hmm. much has changed and and um and just take that in in heart um you know if you've ever walked in a place over 10 years just 10 years and and seen the difference um you can't help but feel this incredible sorrow and at the same time a connection with the planet that you're actually walking on because you see that that this Gaia the, the, the is is evolving and changing constantly just the way our universe is and um, I don't think it has a moral yes or no but and um, photography does have that impact and that's I mean what I, I think research shows that our brains um, three quarters of our brain is involved in in visual processing so there's no wonder that yeah. images are so strong because it really touches almost every part of our brains in some way or another. While I don't know, speech, yeah. speech, and and writing is only only touches a, a much smaller area. So we are visual creatures, for sure. Um, and visual stuff also needs to be brought into the world so we can touch it. So you brought us a uh, paper. Yeah, I, th I thought this is on the technical end. Um, I've had really interesting experimentation with uh, washi ink jet printing paper. It is, it's a delicate thing uh, to use. Often their thinnest one needs to be attached to a thicker piece of paper, so it won't be chewed up. Um, but because of the um, incredible absorption of inks here, if you play your cards right <laughs> and and print the right images in the right way, uh, and again, um, I have the advantage of using piezo, so I can adjust uh, how much ink I lay down on any particular piece of paper. And and uh, I'm not an expert on color printing um, with uh, piezo, but certainly on black and white. Um, there is a, a, a real another creative adjunct um, to it, and in, in our world of kind of digital um, kind of expression of image making, I want to go back to a kind of handmade paper, a real tactile sense, where you can see the fibers, where it just feels like an object rather than a subject only. I, I remember uh, that's like ten years ago. I worked with uh, Hewlett Packard for a printer of theirs to help to help get the word out and they had uh, very good good inks for that printer it's not it's not on the market anymore but it was it was um uh particle color particles in the ink as a, as opposed to uh yeah. color in solution so you ended up with um with 
with the color layering on top of the paper and being very vibrant and being very good. And it, uh, it, we, we ended up trying this and we didn't have washi paper to test this, but we ended up uh, just, just for fun trying it out with um, kitchen towels, paper towels. And oh, interesting. That's the same kind of thing. It's the right? same type of uh, thing, but... Absorption. Of, of yeah. Absorption, at least, they're, yes. They're built for absorption, right? That's how they're... And it was it was it was just amazing how uh, how how if if you do it right how what what kind of amazing results you can get from these types of media so washi paper yeah well but by, by the way I think piezo inks are are uh, you know a lot of them carbon suspended um, and and that's what gives it this beautiful richness. Oh yeah, this the, the this ink is, is layered. On this it. is high tech, and for for these type of uh, prints, the uh, the the cost of the ink is at least partially justified, I would say, because I've I've looked into into how that stuff is tested and made, and it was it was amazing to see what they do in terms of color stability over time, and they have big yeah. these big big machines where they kind of uh, force age the prints with sure. uh, a lot of uv yeah. and with uh with ozone and then they and then they go and buy the competitions ink and try it with them too and see who's better and some of the some of those inks nowadays with the paper they have uh they have uh, a, a, a they last for like a couple of hundred years easily if you yeah. keep them in you know, like museum kind of conditions if you don't put them in direct sunlight all the time and that kind of stuff you it's know that's interesting amazing what's possible. i think if we if we ever uh start to kind of interview some random people i, I i'd love to hoodwink uh, john Cohn from vermont and he's one of the, the founders of piezography mm -hmm. and, and is a spectacularly interesting person to talk to and very relatable um, in terms of art, science, and process. Um, uh, his his new work, which which he shares with me often, I is on gravure, and and uh, we've done an experiment uh, where I took a completely digital uh, landscape that I made, a lunar landscape, um, and uh, burnt it onto a gravure plate and, and kind of processed it, uh, washed it and then hand printed it with on a, on a, um, basically a gravure printer with like rubbing the ink in and whatnot. And it's one of the most extraordinarily beautiful things that I've ever made, um, with his help, obviously it took almost going to say, maybe a week and a half to make one image oh, wow. because every the burning you know it's kind of uh, trial by error uh and and uh, then the the processing of the plate the baking of the plate you know the wiping of the plate how much ink you use um all of that stuff and then the actual you have to print on wet paper you know in these prints and you get i mean it looks like an etching but it is purely photographic um and um so that that was something that really excited me. As interested interested as I am in all kinds of future tech, this was a, again a real combination of uh, tech that's five hundred years old easily in terms of gravure uh, and etching and you know lithography etching etc. That printing process and digital um, polygonal construction. Of images, I mean, it is really a combination of stuff that could never have been done years ago, it's really and, and also a combination of skills that only exist today and have didn't exist fifty years ago. That's right. right. And he's been working with color, which is even more difficult because oh, yeah. you have to print it four times, exactly registered, pin registered, etc., on those things. So uh, that's that's kind of the next mountain to climb. But um, you know. Uh, I and he he gives um, workshops in Vermont. They're they're in a beautiful place, and and uh, I encourage all to visit piezography.com. It's a very interesting place. That would be another pick. All right, and that brings us to the end of this episode. What a what a, what a what a what an eclectic choice and a mix of, of topics. But I love this. I love this. I really like this. Where maybe maybe uh, if you're listening to this and uh, you. You got something out of this? Let us know. We have uh, 
places where you can yeah. contact us. Or if you have interesting picks, put them on our Discord. Maybe we'll, we'll visit them and, and do a shout out to them. Absolutely. We're always looking for interesting stuff, especially for these kind of shows. Um, I'm always interested in anything. I'm, <laughs> I'm cur- curious, by, curious by nature. So, um, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, don't forget to check us out on thefuturephotography.com. We're online on the Twitters and so on. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks all. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.